Alrighty. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Boak, Chairman of the Kennebunk Port Planning Board. This is a virtual planning board meeting. We're meeting using Zoom. Uh, the agenda is on the town's website and has information needed to, to participate in the conferencing format. If you wish to participate through Zoom, you can join webinar ID 992279747695. You can also dial in on the phone at 929-205-6099, and then you have to enter the meeting ID. As always, you can watch us on County Bonport television, on YouTube, or on channel 1301. During the meeting, only planning board and the current uh, participant will be on the screen with audio connected. All other participants will be blacked out and audio muted, except when the board solicits its input. If a public hearing is on the agenda for a particular topic, as the first three items tonight are, applicant and board members will have discussions after which I will open the public hearing. At that time, anyone who wishes to be heard should raise your hand in Zoom, which will, we will recognize those, those people who wish to talk one at a time if you're using your telephone, raise your hand to star six and toggle move to star nine. Items four and five, the Dow House Pier and the Oceanwood Resort are in initial reviews, so only the board and applicants will be heard and the public hearing will be at a later time. Meeting is a pretty long agenda. We'll not start a new topic after 9 p.m. Any items that have not been discussed at that point will be continued to the meeting on July 21st. So attendance, we seem to have, okay, I know George, George is, is out of town and missing and Pierce Scott is not here, but everybody else is here. If it remains that way, John, of course you get to vote. <laughs> okay, so that's attendance is in good shape. The uh, approval of the minutes. Now we, everybody got the minutes, I know, um, Nina and I caught the word included, which Nina tells me should be occluded, right? Occluded. Occluded. So we've we've already transmitted that that correction. And I guess uh, Larry had some corrections that he's withdrawn. Is that correct? Yes, correct. Okay. All right. So with the one word changed, uh, do I hear a motion on the minutes? I move to approve as modified with your one change. Uh, there was another change in there, okay. and I changed E L L to L on the um, under uh, the the the, the Dow House Limited. Under the Dow. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's that's fine, and she knows about that, right? Oh yes. Uh huh. Okay, good. So, as 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 we've already told her about, so you've moved. So Larry has been as you know, amended by you and. Nina, yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I'll second so, the motion. Okay, well, okay, let me go through the usual list. I'm in favor of that. Nina? In favor. Ed? In favor. Larry? In favor. John? In favor. Okay, cool. All right, the units are approved, which brings us to the first item, which is, excuse me, Item 210501, Bowsprit, Kenny Bunkport, LLC, William Walsh, authorized agent. It's a preliminary subdivision review for 164 Wilds District Road, Ed Francis, case manager. So if we can bring in uh, Mr. Walsh and uh, also the uh, the two people in uh, the, the family in charge of this. So uh, Norm Chamberlain is with Walsh. I'm not sure who uh, Brendan is, uh, but I'm not sure that that's an authorized agent. 
Yep. Yes. Yes. They're, they're, they're the owners. Uh, Michael Michael Borowski is also an owner. Right. I don't know Brendan. Perhaps he's someone that wants to talk in the uh, public hearing portion. We'll uh, assume that at this point and. Uh, why don't you proceed, Bill? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, Bill Walsh with Walsh Engineering. Um, Norm Chamberlain is here. Norm's going to be my wingman tonight. I'm juggling another meeting in another town. So um, Norm's going to run with this, if you don't mind. Um, so I, I just wanted to say hello to everybody and get Norm kicked off in the right direction. I'll be standing um, aside here and answering questions if needed. Okay. Norm. Hi, good evening. Uh, if you'd like, I could go through a, a short presentation. Yeah. Do you want to share a screen or you? Yeah, let me, uh, oops, wrong. Okay, is everyone seeing that? Yep. Okay, so uh, I'm Norm Chamberlain with Walsh Engineering here on behalf of Abby Golden Farm and Michael Borowski, who are DBA Bowsprit Kenny Bunkport, uh, the applicant. Uh, this is uh, we are here for preliminary subdivision review for the property located at 164 Wilds District Road in Cape Corpus. Uh, we had been with the board previously in April, uh, again in early May for a site walk and last on June 16th, where the board accepted the preliminary plan application for review. So the existing site here is at the intersection of uh, Route 9 and Wilds District Road. It's a 3.4 acre lot. Uh, presently it contains a single family residential structure and a detached garage near Wilds District Road and a driveway that extends through to Route 9. Um, we have uh, Water District land here on this side, uh, Wild District Road to the south, Pennybunk Conservation land here on the end of the uh, intersection and Route 9 to the north. So the residential structure is located on the southeasterly corner of the property down here, uh, and the majority of the site is undeveloped. Vegetation is a mixture of evergreen and deciduous growth. Uh, there's also some stone walls here in front of the house and down along Wilds District Road. Uh, the zoning is uh, located in uh, Cape Corpus West, which allows for 20,000 square foot lots. The net residential density calculations, we have 103,606 square feet of property, which uh, provides for uh, almost 5.2 units. So we could have five units on this property. The proposed development is uh, four units, uh, four separate lots and some open space up in here. Three of the lots will be on Wilds District Road. Uh, one, lots one and two will share a driveway at the existing or approximately at the existing driveway location. Lot three will also have a driveway onto Wilds District Road and lot four will have one onto Route 9. All lots have frontage onto the open space. Um, water, so uh, lots uh, two, three, and four will be serviced from taps off Route 9, and lot one will use the existing service. We've already met with the water district and discussed the project and received a capacity to serve letter back in May. Uh, the water district all said, also said they did not have a concern with the construction unit tank. They did note that it will need to be painted soon and that would generate a fair amount of noise for the new residents here. Uh, sewer, lot one, again, will use the existing service. Lots two and three will connect on to Wilds District Road and lot four will have a new service via an easement 
over lot one onto Wilds District Road. Uh, we also received a capacity to serve letter back in May. Uh, electric service uh, is expected to be underground service on site to all the lots. Uh, driveway access, uh, as I mentioned before, lots one and two are going to share a driveway. Um, we've, we need to, to do a significant amount of grading along Wilds District Road to provide some uh, site distance here. I uh, will require the removal of ledge. And um, again, for lot three, we're going to have to do a little bit of trimming in, the, in this area here to provide that required site distance road. Um, we have received confirmation from Public Works that they will verify that the driveways meet the required site distance after the work is completed. Uh, and we have prepared some plan profiles for that work. Uh, that's pretty much my presentation. I, I entertain questions from the board. Okay. Um, so I don't have any new questions. Uh, Ed, you're the Ed, manager. What do you have? I have a, a few a few questions. Um, so, some are real nits. I just was curious, the stone wall removal on uh, Route 9 the, 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 for Lot 4, is that constrained to the driveway entrance? You're going to leave the rest of that? Uh, we have to take out, I think, all of it. Uh, no, I'm not sharing anywhere. Let me put that back up. We're going to have to take out quite a bit in this area. Um, okay, I'm talking this. about lot four now. Oh, lot four? No, we don't have to do anything for lot four. Let me go back to that. We have plenty of sight distance because we're on the outside of the curve. Yeah. So we can see both directions quite easily. So there's really no regrading or anything in that area. Okay. Thank you. And you. So, so as you said, you're doing quite quite a bit of work, making quite an investment in uh, making the line of sites what they need to be on the Wilds District side. H how are you going to ensure that that is maintained over time? Seems like it would be very easy for plantings and or wild growth to to uh, spring up there and just just bring uh, it right back to where it is now. Well, I think there's a lot of ledge there, so I don't imagine that we're going to have much for large growth. That's mostly what's coming out in this area. I, I, hey, Norm, I think we could we could have easements. It may make sense to have easements along those front front lots, Ed, just so the neighbors can take care of that. Should there be any issue? Yeah, I didn't know if you'd you'd make it a, a job of the HOA or. or uh, it yeah, just that's... seems like we're, we're, you're doing all the right things right now, but how do you, how do you main how do you maintain that? safety critical view over time. And I just yeah, appreciate it if you gave us some thought and maybe spoke to it in the, in the final. Absolutely. I think that's a good point, Ed. I Thank think you. it could be as part of the HOA. I haven't really put that I, one I just don't know how to, you know, myself how to go about that. The, um, as I understand it, um, I saw, for example, the letter of authorization uh, is from Abby and Michael as Bowsprit. The um, the application now is in the name of Bowsprit with uh, a Charleston Mass uh, address. There's there's nothing in here, and, and, oh, and the deed is, is to Bowsprit, but there's nothing on those documents that, that ties this to, to the two applicants that are here tonight, to me. <clears throat> and then I see that the main registration for a Bowsprit LLC, which I'm assuming is the same bowsprit, but there doesn't seem to be a way for me to tie that to the to the one with the Charleston address. And I see that that has an agent, I forget his name, uh, Charles Miller, who seems to be another person. Is, is there a way to clean all of that up so that it's obvious that the people who bought this own it and <laughs> are making this application? Uh, thank you. Um, we can provide our operating agreement to you to to link all of the documents. So yeah, to, not to me personally, but just just to add it to the package. Sure, it, yeah, it, we, can, we can certainly do that. Be a nice bow to, to put on the top of this. Um, 
I had a question about the street identifiers that these four homes will go by. I, I see that the subdivision name is proposed to be 164 Wiles District Road. That, that seems wrong um, mm -hmm. in that I assume one of these homes is already got that address and will retain it. The subdivision, you know, has three more homes in it. And so so again, it's just, it's just a, a bit of confusion there that could be tidied up. What, lots two and three will, will get addresses from the assessor's office mm -hmm. for Wilds mm -hmm. District Road. Okay. And um, the lot four will get one on uh, Main Street. And lot one, as I'm, as I'm guessing, will will be continue to be I'm, one. I'm assuming it would retain the 164 address. So you might just uh, think about the statement in there that the subdivision name is proposed to be 164 Wiles District Road and maybe abbreviate that somehow or put the, the historical captain's name on it or just, I don't know what you're gonna do. But <laughs> um, let me see. Has there been or uh, any contact with the fire chief or, or and can there be a review by the fire chief and a letter from him in the final? Yeah, well, he's fine with the access that his emergency vehicles will yeah, have to these I, four. So Ed, we, we don't typically get a, an, uh, a review letter uh, regarding the driveway accesses for single families. This uh, is a subdivision though. Sure. No, understood. And you would, uh, and you would definitely, typically see that for uh, for a subdivision road. Uh, but we'll we'll definitely make sure that Chief Everett has. Well, he he has seen the plan, you know, and didn't note any objections to me in regard to okay. that. But we'll make sure that you get a letter uh, in that regard. Uh, we are going to be doing. Uh, you know, we we have a, a staff meeting set up for tomorrow. You know, to go over. Uh, just some of the coordination uh, discussions regarding, you know, the town's plan for Wilds District Road. Uh, you know, there's and, yeah. for, exactly. Yep. So we would just want to make sure that we have, you know, that we're all on the same page. We have a coordinated effort and that it's, you know, that it's clear uh, in, in terms of what's being removed from, you know, from the right of way in terms of ledge and, and things of that nature. So. Right. Yeah, not um, as long as the fire, something from the fire chief <clears throat> is in the final. Yep. yep. Saying saying he doesn't have any objections, I'm fine. I, I look at the the water tower and the the fact that you know there could be an emergency there sometime, and it, it, it's just a an area I'd hate to you know look back on and say, gosh, we should have had a review. It sounds like you already got it covered. Yep. Now we'll we'll make Thank sure you. that you get a that you get a formal letter there. Okay. Um. How are you going to handle the ownership of the open space parcel? Is that going to go to to an HOA? Is that how that will be handled? Yes, that'll be covered by the HOA documents and owned in um, together with all four lots. So there'll be a, a fifth deed, if you will. I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And you said that. We had capacity to serve letters from the water and from the sewer in May. Was that in the in the uh, in the sketch plan, or I didn't see a copy of them in this application? Maybe, maybe I just missed them. I can check and see if that was. It should have been submitted uh, with our preliminary. Plans. And again, I'm happy to have those just. I think it, we, yeah, we had part of the we could, Yeah, it looks like when we submitted, we had requested ability to serve. Yeah. Um, and we've received those since then. And we can provide those uh, letters and emails back to, to Warner. And again, we don't need them today. They just should be part yep. of the, the final. That's, that's all. I think that's all I had. Thank, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Larry, do you have anything? 
Well, I just uh, want to make sure, um, did the water district say they don't have any concerns about excavation in the vicinity of the water tower? They did say that. Okay. And we right, can submit you. that letter as well. That would, that would be great. Thank you. Or email, I should say. All right. Thanks. That's it. Uh, Nina? Okay. Anything on this one? You're, you're muted. Still okay. Better. <laughs> yeah, it's better. Okay, I just wanted to confirm that uh, we discussed an easement in the HOA along the uh, sewer line between, uh, I think it was um, lot one and two, maybe, uh, so that there wouldn't be any growth that had deep roots, basically, that could get into that sewer line. And, and just to, well, that's okay. Uh, I don't have anything else. Yeah, those are things we'll make sure get into the letter that Ed is going to help me write. Okay. <laughs> Nina, remind me where that easement is between which two lots? Uh, I think Three. it's one and two. It's between it's one four. Or, it's between four across one down to Wilds District Row. Right, right. Thank you. And so, you know, all the adjacent properties basically uh, should have an easement to restrict the kind of vegetation they grow uh, around that sewer line. Okay. So, John, do you have anything? John? No. Okay. And I, I guess uh, we discussed it last time. There's a couple of... Uh, I mean, there, there's some waiver. There's a waiver relative to the shared driveway, the uh, which Warner discussed, I guess, the last time, which we, needs to find its way into the final. So, I guess I don't have anything else. Uh, so, this is a public hearing. I guess I will uh, open the uh, public hearing. So. If you wish to be heard, please uh, raise your digital hand. I'm sorry, what? Yes, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Great, hi, I'm a resident at 6 High Street. My name is Jen Haas. Um, I do travel along that road to go to Cape Corpus quite frequently. I've looked at the proposed plan and one of the things that I found to be um, super helpful and that I really liked was the relocation of the driveway on Route 9. Um, I had a opportunity to also drive through the property a couple of days ago, I noticed that it is abandoned. There's a lot of overgrowth, um, lots of vegetation that's, you know, preventing people from easily seeing exit from the um, from the driveway. And so, for cars that are going over the hill on their way into Cape Corpus, um, the relocation of the driveway seems like it would improve the traffic um, and reduce um, accidents along that road. And that's all I had to comment on. Yeah, that's what that's really why they moved it. So yes, great. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, do we have any? Okay. Great. Hey, everyone. Um, yeah, this is Dina on behalf of my husband, Tim, who's here with me, too. Just I'm, on, I'm the one on headset. Um, yeah, we just wanted to, to speak our, our approval and support for the, for the plan as well. I think, you know, we're really familiar with the area. I think one um, one thing that both Tim and I really like is, is that it's using minimal, it's putting, it's proposing putting minimal lots on it. It, it, it could put more, lot, the applicant could put more lots on it than, than they, they are proposing. I think they could put 
as many as five, but they only want to put four, which I think we 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 think is great for for the plan. And um, I think we just think it's really thoughtful, and I think it's it's a you know it's revitalizing. An, an existing area, an existing property, and I would be really, really psyched to, to see it go through. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, okay. So I guess I, I'm going to close the public hearing. And uh, so I guess, I mean, Ed, you. You have enough uh, yeah. at this point I, I, to, to, to get the letter squared away. So yeah, I would I would move to to approve this preliminary application. Okay. I'll second second. It. Okay. Well, I'm going to go through the names again, and I'm in favor. Nina. In favor. Ed. Yes, in favor. Larry. In favor. Yeah. In favor. Okay. So, thank you very much, folks. We'll, we'll uh, in the next few days, uh, Ed and I will put together a letter which says that you, you're, uh, we have preliminarily approved it, and we kind of expect these things to show up in the in the final, which you've already heard about. So, thank you very much. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank everyone. you. Thanks. So, anyhow, so that's it. Thank you. Okay, so the next thing is is item 210503 Verizon Wireless, Scott Anderson Esquire, authorized agent. So is Mr. Anderson out there? Thank you. Hello there. Okay. No, you were, you were going, Mr. Anderson. You were going to provide us a where where we could see one of these things in town, where there might be one on a pole. Oh. oh, apologies. I thought here. Let me get my little list here. Um, uh, we had talked about that, and I thought that was information that you had. Uh, were folks able to go look at these, or did you not have the information to do that? Yeah, I. I never got the information. Did you get the information, Larry? No. Look, no. We we did discuss at the meeting that there was one located on Jeffries. Okay. Yeah. So we had, you know, the the question had come up about kind of how this one fits into the bigger system, um, and we have right now uh, Kenny Bunkport is targeted for a group of six small cells. Um, four of them, we had already gone through the permitting um, about I don't know, maybe 12, 14 months ago, um, and that's numbers two, three, four, and six. The one before you now is number five, and there is a, a, a sixth one called Kenny Bunkport SC01 um, that, that should be coming soon out of the engineering team, although I don't know exactly where it's going to be located or what the timing is, but um, the one before you today and the four that we've done is, is part of an initial group of six that are planned for Kenny Bunkport. I, I apologize for the confusion about getting you the information about the, the locations um, of the ones. Um, I'm not sure where, do you know if Verizon act, has actually installed those other four yet? I know we pulled the permits a while ago, but I often don't get much info on construction timing. Yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head if the other ones were installed. Uh, I do know the one on Jeffries was installed. Okay. Can you, can you tell me if any of them are around Dock Square or proposed to be around Dock Square? I, I don't believe so. Five of the six are all on Kings Highway. They run between, I think, 120 and 301. And my numbering might be a little off because I see the address has changed, but five of the six are on Kings Highway. I think the other one was originally planned for Ocean Ave, um, but I'm not sure if that is a location that they're going to stick with or whether that sixth uh, facility is going to move. 
Um, and normally the way it works is they try to bring these small cells, as we talked about last time, into locations where um, they're seeing a significant adverse impact during kind of the high traffic summer months. Um, and so these initial six are designed to address those areas that they think they'll really help. There can be other areas in town that might require a bigger facility that can't be fixed with the small cells. Um, and that's a slightly different track. And I think we still have kind of challenges in Kenny Bunkport because new tower sites are not allowed very many places. And so that's kind of a siting constraint that we just have to work with. Yeah. I have trouble understanding that because Dock Square is, you know, a, a high residential area and where you're going along Ocean Ave, there isn't, I mean, it's residential, but it's nothing uh, compared to Dock Square when all the tourists come in and start using their cell phones. Yeah. And we noticed when we live around Dock Square that summer months, things really get a gap you know, we really have trouble keeping the internet um, running smoothly. Yeah, and I appreciate that. We had a similar issue in a Gunkport where we came in with three sites, but um, one of them wasn't near one of the municipal parking lots where they were trying to use these smart meters to collect parking fees and the wireless coverage was so bad, the smart meters wouldn't work. And we were trying to work with the public works department to try to get Verizon to focus on some additional sites and Unfortunately, that the kind of RF engineers are doing small cells in some areas. They're doing new tower sites in other areas, and it, it, it's not always. Those don't always seem to be the most organized rollout um, that it could be. And you know, sometimes the engineers are working with information about how the existing system is working, but they don't know as much about kind of the local demand and 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 issues that are really specific to a community. They try to understand how the existing system is running, um, but they don't always get it exactly right. Um, we're I, I can believe that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, we're off topic. So. Yes. And anyway, I think Larry had some questions and he is the uh, case manager, so. Great, go for it. Okay, thank you, Scott. So, um, so I'm starting on, uh, I actually have several questions. So starting on the application for the site plan review, um, you know, the applicant is Verizon and the owner of record is Fairpoint. Uh, do we have a document clarifying that you're the authorized spokesperson for the owner and well, applicant? I'm not sure quite how this is gonna work. Uh, yeah, let me see if we, I don't think I have uh, a letter of authorization from Verizon Wireless uh -huh. that's separate um, in the in the document itself. I think what we've given you is the pole attachment agreement and then the uh, agreement with the, essentially the closest of butter, who I think lo owns the fee underneath the right of way, uh, mostly for access, but I don't think we've given you an authorization letter from Verizon Wireless. Well, that, that's what we, we normally get. A, the, when you submit a site plan, there's normally a thing that says, we the owner, well, either was, the owner or applicant. Yeah, it'd be great if we just had a one page separate, uh, you know, thing from our Verizon saying that gotcha. we're, the, we're, you know, we, we authorize Scott Anderson to, uh, to handle Thanks. all of the permitting issues associated with this application, something like that. Right, yes, and I, I know we do, we, I've done that many times before, um, so I can obtain one of those from uh, Paula Foley, who's my contact at Verizon Wireless. That'd be great, and it would also be great to understand the connection between applicant and the owner. So the, the way I would interpret this is Fairpoint Communications own Verizon Wireless, or maybe they're a some kind of a franchisee or something, I don't know. But it, if, if you could have a one page description of how Verizon Wireless is related to Fairpoint and is related to you as the says, authorized spokesperson. It says Fairpoint and CMP. I think it's the owner of the poll. Yes, okay. so the poll owner is Fairpoint and CMP. 
And so we have the attachment agreement, which is essentially like a lease with okay. Fairpoint CMP. And then Verizon Wireless is the applicant and Verizon Wireless will be installing its equipment on the pole. Okay, if you could, if we could have like a little, you know, one paragraph just from Verizon. Okay. Clarifying all of this, that would really be handy. And then, um, then I noticed there was no phone or email for the Fairpoint communications. Uh, I don't know if that matters. Uh, um, what, when, in your letter, maybe you could just clarify that whole, you know, section one and two. And then, um, then the subject property, okay. The, uh, I, I appreciate that once upon a time, the address was 180 Kings Highway, but it's actually now 600, 674 Kings Highway. So apparently a couple of years ago, there was some renumbering. And so we need to, you know, refer to the current number, which is 674. Okay. And then, uh, okay. well, the, the numbers just changed in the past few months, ah. you know, so, you know, so we're still working through a transition with the data that we have that's available online. Uh, you know, the, uh, it takes, you know, as, as much as folks think it happens, you know, with a finger snap, it takes a little bit for all of the, all of the parties to get the right, you know, data for the address changes. But, but yeah, okay. that just, that just occurred in the, you know, in the past few months. Okay. So, for purposes of this application, I, I mean, it really should be referred to 674 though, right? That, that's correct, yes. Okay, all right. Yeah. yeah, I'd have to look back at the timing of when we got the app, but you know, but you know, technically, yes, we've, we're operating under a new 911 address there. Okay, thank May you. May 13th. It's May 13th? Quite a while back, yeah. All right. And then, um, and then it's uh, Goose Rocks, you know, and then going and then continuing on, on paragraph three, of course, it was known as Goose Rocks, but then the tax assessor's map, it's, you know, map 34, block two, lot 14, which, you know, you in, you've actually included a map showing this, but, you know, since you have the info, it'd be great if you could just complete your, your application. Then, then it's I guess we haven't put that information in because we're within the public right of way, which I think is outside the boundaries of that tax and map lot. Um, so mm -hmm. that's the I think we had that had been identified as the closest lot and of the owners where we have this access agreement just in the event the construction folks step on it. But we hadn't included that information just because we were in, in the right of way strip. Yeah, that, that's correct. I mean, this application does, really doesn't technically get assigned to that, you know, to that parcel since it's within the, you know, since it's within the right of way. Uh, you know, it's a, I, I guess, more of a uh, paperwork conundrum that we have in terms of assigning where the permits go for that, you know, for the work that occurs within the right of way. But again, for our purposes, that's why it was directed so, towards that so, parcel. So maybe there could be a clarifying notice in the right of way not in a actual uh, block or lot, I don't know. No, we could certainly clarify that it's nearest to that specific lot, just right. for purposes of locating it on the you face. Did that in, you did that in a couple of places, yeah, but it'd be, uh, okay, actually you've got that down there, not applicable, it's in the right away. okay, gotcha. It's actually right there. So okay. Then I actually think this is in the shoreland zone. Um, I mean, it's, you know, you look on the map it's clearly that, in that that's correct yes i mean that area you know that area of king's highway is within the shoreland zone and it would be resource protection too well no i don't oh. think so I, the map didn't show that so it just showed shoreland no okay. it's not that's not in a rp area there so if you could put a yes on the shoreland okay and then um and then uh, let's see, I had several others here. So then, um, oh yeah, I guess the next next one. Uh, okay, okay. Then and then the on the Tilson drawings. So this this address of six seventy four. You know, it, it would also affect the Tilson drawings. Um, mm -hmm just as a side side issue and then um 
I did notice I was trying to reconcile your proposal with the um, recently approved wireless telecommunication ordinance. Okay. So, um, and, and there's a couple of spots in here that, um, I, I, you know, maybe you can help us on this Warner, but the, there's the numbers are not the same. Okay. So let's just start with the ordinance. Okay. The ordinance on page okay, it starts on page 10, but really the, the interesting part is on page 11. It says that the, the dimensions of, okay. Okay. It says for a small cell facility, the uh, compliance officer shall approve the application if the if the following is 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 the, is the you know if this found found to be the case, it's not within 50 feet of a residence. Of course, that's why we're listening to this. That's why this is an application because it is within 50 feet of a residence. Yep. So then you go on. This, then it talks about camouflage. I don't know how you could camouflage this very well, um, but um, anyway, you may want to think about. Um, camouflage but then on page 11 there's number four it says the dimensions of the antenna does not exceed three feet in height or two feet in width and associated equipment is a maximum square footage of 10 square feet and a height of two feet and um, then no part of the small and then uh, article five is no part of the small cell facility projects from the utility pole further than four feet from its existing height and two feet from its existing width okay so uh, I looked at the drawings, uh, remembering these dimensions, and the one that come, that really stuck out was on drawing uh, Tilson drawing CD dash three. Mm -hmm. It looks like the height is three point two feet. Okay, so we don't have to answer this right now. I'm just saying three point two feet. Then, if you look at um, then if you look at drawing um, LE4, um, it looks like the height is um, 41 inches, which is basically uh, three foot seven or three foot five, I guess, three foot five. And then if you look at uh, in Appendix K, Appendix K is very interesting. Lots of information in Appendix K. Um, there's also, it also talks about a proposed antenna specification and orientation and it looks like it comes up to uh, 40 um, well 45 inches you know which would be well over three feet you know and so and, um, other than the one so on the one on CD3 yeah. has got specific above ground levels on them and so that runs from 29.7 to 32.9 yeah 3.2 so, feet what's that 3.2 feet right and so the except the part of that distance is the mounting bracket for the antenna so um and then, of course, on CD4, there's no scale, I don't think, or distance. And now I'm looking at LE4. Yeah, so it's um, an LE4 has the specifics of the size of the antenna itself, 14-inch um, wide by 35.4 inch high called a cantenna. Yeah. Uh, and then you can see the, the bigger specs. So... The, the antenna itself is 35.4 inches. There's a mounting bracket under it that's 5.6. And yeah. that was the basis for our calculations on the um, antenna sides tracking the ordinance requirements. Well, so that's the issue. Do you, does the mounting bracket 5.6 inches, is that included in the three foot height limitation, Werner? You know. uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the ordinance doesn't specify, you know, a height height of the mounting bracket. It only calls out it. It only calls out the antenna height. I thought, Larry, would you read it again? I, I thought you said it was the height above the pole. Well, that's exactly what it says here. So just um, read it again. 
Uh, let me pull it up as well it, here. It's it's page 10, approval. Yeah. So the um, oh, okay. oh, compliance officer shall approve the application if the compliance officer finds, you know, there's a thing about the 50 feet and then camouflage and then on page 11, it goes to uh, paragraph four. Uh, the dimension of the antenna does not exceed three feet in height or two feet in width and associated equipment has a maximum square footage uh, of 10 feet and a height of two feet. No part of the small cell facility projects from the utility pole further than four feet, okay, oh. from the existing height and two feet from the existing width, okay. So that's how they cover the the bra the support bracket right there okay. in sounds like they made that item up. five. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. So, yeah. So we just interpreted that as the projection included the bracket, so we had to stay yep. under four feet and right. Okay. Good. And then how does that how does that um, what's just so then what is the significance of this LE three in Appendix K, which talks about um, proposed antenna specification, even though they say it's not to scale. It, let's see, it's... Yeah, so that was the, the version that had been given to the property owner at the time they were getting permission for access. And then after that happened, I said, you can't build a 38-inch antenna because it's capped at 36. So they amended the plans for this application to bring it under the 36 inch height. Okay. So this is sort of info only um, prototype. Okay. Yeah. And this was essentially the, this was attached to the, um, the agreement sent to Ms. O'Brien and Mr. Garino to get access, but the exact spe specifics of the insulation on the pole weren't really of concern to them. It was just, kind of know, knowing generally where things would be and that, that they would be in the right of way installing the, the equipment. That's right, okay. I forgot about that, that the original drawing so, had a, a facility that was too big for your ordinance. Okay, so do you wanna maybe put a, a some kind of a stamp on this page saying something like info or preliminary prototype or something like that so it's clear that this is not going to be the one that's installed yes no yeah so that's the note that the attachment to the access agreement um, uh, is not the proposed site plan right okay thank you and then um, on sheet le-2 which is right there by le-3 there's a note it says a structural un loading analysis of the existing structure to support the proposed loading has not been performed by Tilson. So. Uh, is that still in, in tab K? That's in K, tab K, yeah. Yeah, so I'm trying to say the date. Uh, so the date of that plan is August 26, 2016. If you go to tab um, H of the application packet. Yeah. Again, you know, a lot of times, I mean, this site was going to come out with the original four, which is why there's such a lag between the access date. So when it came time to actually come through to permitting, um, Tilson did the structural analysis that's included at, at tab yep. eight, showing that the pole can handle it. Okay, so K is, so the appendix K is really just a, a starting point and it's a, uh, not to not for construction. I guess that'd be the big thing to put a big not for construction. That's right, and and, and that that is only attached there um, because we wanted to give you the complete access agreement that had gone to the abutting property owners, and that was the plan in place at the time when they uh, signed off on that. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. And um, let me see here. Appendix I. Oh yeah. Then in Appendix I. Um, there is, um, this is the cellular license, uh, Portland Cellular partnership with uh, Verizon Wireless. And um, there's some, there's some uh, questions. There's a bunch of questions here. I guess this is something you file with, I don't know, FCC or somebody. I'm not sure what the point of this is, but 
uh, uh, it talks about alien ownership. Is the applicant a foreign government? No. Is the applicant an alien? No. Is the applicant a corporation? No. Is the applicant a corporation? No. And then th the next two, is the applicant directly or indirectly controlled by other corporation? Yes. And is, if the answer to the above is yes, has the applicant received a ruling uh, respect to the radio service involved? Yes. So can you, Claire, could you uh, share with us the, um, what, what the answer, well, what, what is the name of the organization that is behind the the yes there the the applicant directly or indirectly controlled by an other corporation? Yeah, I, I don't know who that is. So this is the FCC license. Yeah. Um, the way this works is Verizon and the other carriers bid on a uh, certain uh, kind of bandwidth and frequency. Yeah. Um, and so when that uh, frequency bandwidth is awarded to Verizon. This is the license, and these are some provisions that govern, you know, ownership under the FCC's federal rules, and you have to jump through certain hoops depending on who owns you, because the concept here is that these are public airwaves, um, and that's why the FCC issues a license, because Verizon, at t and the other carriers get the right to use public airspace to do their business and send the signals. So this is just part of the FC, FCC's um, federal regulations. If a certain percentage of your stock is owned by you know, a certain type of corporation, you have to go to the FCC and get a ruling in which they evaluate who it is and they give you the blessing and then you're fine. So I'm not sure who the entity is here. Um, um, and I'm not even sure whether it's for the partnership, which is Portland Cellular, or Verizon in total, it's probably a Portland Cellular partnership. Um, I could probably figure that out, but kind of for all intents and purposes for the town, that's really something that's regulated just by the FCC. Well, see, what got me was uh, not being familiar with this. It, it, you know, this whole section is alien ownership, and it's there's four no, and then there's two yes, and then there's a comment that the applicant answered no to each of the basic qualification questions, except that two of them seem to have a yes by them. So it confused me. Um, yeah, so this is the, the license that's actually issued by the FCC. So uh -huh. I think the, the point to that statement is that, F, that Verizon Wireless complies with all of the FCC's regulations that govern you know, ownership of the license and have gone through all the processes to comply with the FCC's rules. Um, and so that's, you know, this is, this is not a document that's generated by Verizon Wireless. It's generated by the FCC and just uh, confirms that we have the license um, and have complied with all the FCC's rules. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so this is the license granted by the FCC. Uh, thanks. This for is really part of kind of right title and interest, right? You, you, you need anyone that comes to you and says, hey, we're going to put antennas up on somebody's house, a tower or whatever, to not only show they have a lease, but to show that they're actually authorized to install and run the equipment. So because of the nature of who we are, this is, and this is in pretty much everyone's ordinance. You have to provide a copy of your FCC license so that you see we can actually use the approval that you might grant us. Okay, great. So, um, I did notice that something is going to expire in October this year. Is there any concern about renewing it? No, they, these go on, um, um, I think it's 10 year uh, um, uh, rounds and th they will just issue another one um, every 10 years. You know, they'll check if there's been any change in the corporate ownership. It, I mean, it's like any other license, right? I mean, there are certain coverage rules, uh, duty to serve, you know, Verizon can't just go to New York and Boston and leave rural Maine out of it. So they will monitor the carriers for compliance with all of the FCC rules. And they have this hook that if you're not going to comply, you know, if you have a problem, all they have to do is not reuse you, you your license and they don't actually have to take any steps to pull it away. But um, lawyers hate to speak in absolutes, but there's pretty much a 0% chance that Verizon Wireless will mess this one up and lose their FCC license. So. Uh, okay, that should, that should get reissued shortly. All right, just wondered about that. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. And then, um, 
But then I did take a look at the um, the design that uh, Tilson did, and I, I really appreciate the, uh, the clear uh, basis of design that you included there. Thanks. Um, I did wonder a little bit about the wind speed, though. 39.5 miles an hour seems kind of low. And you mean in the structural? Yeah, in the structural and Appendix H. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've never done one of these right, but, um, uh, and of course you would expect that um, the, there's not much wind area, so you expect maybe it's not going to be such a big deal, but um, I didn't do the analysis, and 39 miles an hour seems very low. I mean, the you know the hundred-year storm around here is like a Category Two hurricane, which would have 110 miles an hour. You might not want to go that far, but 39 seems like you know lower than what you could reasonably expect in any 10-year period, anyway. Yeah, and there, there, I think the reason why that wind speed is used is in their modeling, they pick like a, a median or an average based on certain conditions. And then the, the data basically extrapolates, you know, to the, the, the edges of the frequency of what you normally see. So this isn't a, a plan that says, hey, at 39.53 miles per hour, the site's okay. But if you hit 40, you know, the canister is going to snap off and fly, fly away. It's just the modeling um, speed that's used. And then their calculations look at, Kind of worst case scenarios which of course for this area most certainly go up to 60 70 80 miles an hour at times when you have storms but um that you know based on the the calculations um that is the the, the kind of set modeling speed that they use to make sure that all is well but this design will work at wind speeds far in excess of 39 miles an hour without losing any of the equipment because as you noted larry we we get that all we get that all the time oh yeah okay all right so yeah i mean i i was guessing that this is kind of a standard number and it sounds like it's sort of a mean number and there must be some distribution about that for the purposes of the analysis yep so that was it really i think okay anyone Thank else you. uh have questions for verizon here well, I guess uh, I can open up the public hearing. Anyone interested in speaking about Verizon out there? Hey, it's actually uh, Paul Hogan. I had uh, two questions. One, I assume this is kind of like a phase one for Goose Rocks, and I'm just wondering, uh, you know, what I've read about 5G is that you need these every block, every two blocks in order to make them work. So are we looking at dozens or hundreds over the next couple of years coming before us? And um, secondly, I've been look, I just looked at the ordinance on wireless, which I had not really ever looked at before. So I'm just wondering about the economics of this. Uh, we gave, the town gave CMP uh, the right to run polls and to, uh, it was originally Verizon, or maybe it wasn't originally Verizon, but it became Verizon, which has been sold off several times since then. So now Fairpoint owns these poles and the wires, and they're just going out and starting a new business. Is, is the town making money on this, I would hope? Um, you know, if someone wanted to put up uh, advertising uh uh, flags or bright lights, you know, signs on our poles, would that be acceptable? Order, you want to speak to that? 
so I'm not aware of the town receiving any financial compensation for the use of these poles. And from what I understand, the town doesn't own the poles. Uh, you no, know, no, when you, when didn't every town make money on a cable deal and you gave, uh, you know, one company got the rights to run cable and the town got certain compensation like the cable channel? Uh, you know, I, I can't speak to that, Paul. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. So they can run any business they want off these polls. I guess, yeah, I'll, I'll let Scott jump in on that. I guess I don't understand the question about running any business off of the polls. Uh, I mean, we, well, you know, the town has, you know, the town has ordinance requirements, you know, regarding, you know, folks placing signage on polls. Uh, and there are, you know, I know there are certain, you know, there are leases relative to, you know, the town recently purchased, you know, all of our lights, uh, you know, the lights that were located on CMP poles so that we have, you know, the ability to replace those. Uh, but that's, you know, that's all that I'm, you know, that, that, that I'm aware of. Other than that, you have these licenses, you know, for, you know, for your utilities, you know, anything from CMP to, to telephone and cable, you know, that operate under uh, leases to use that equipment. So under that wireless statute, which I just, you know, looked at for the first time, sorry, I'm not briefed on it. Um, anyone who owns rights can, can lease to anybody else to run a business on the polls. I mean, I was intrigued by the, you know, the early questions on trying to establish a legal link uh, between the applicant and Verizon, which, you know, no one could establish by the application. So if you want, I could, so the way this has kind of rolled out. I'm asking the, I'm asking the town, not, I, I know what your answer is going to be. So uh, I'm just interested in the town's perspective on um, of a third party coming in and renting space on these poles, which are within the town right of ways. So again, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not entirely sure what your question is on what, you know, what the town perspective is. I mean, you know, we have utility poles that are located within public and private rights of ways that, uh, you know, that we have utility installations on. So I'm, I'm not, not sure I fully understand what your question is, Paul. Well, my question is Verizon is no longer the owner of the poles or the lines or anything else. So then they have a separate business, which didn't exist when you're, easements were all put in. Uh, there was no such thing as wireless. So now they come along, they're in the wireless business, no longer in the landline business. And, uh, uh, and obviously it's a money-making opportunity for CMP and, um, uh, you know, and uh, Fairpoint. And, um, you know, based upon grumblings of neighbors who are having these placed upon their front yards, a uh, distraction um, you know, for people who have these all of a sudden every block along King's Highway. Uh, it's so, my understand, understanding that CMP owns the poles. The town doesn't own the poles. No, I know. I realize that. But they're in your right of way, right? That's correct. They're located within the, within the town's right of way. Right. And you've given them certain rights um, uh, to run those lines. And um, when the, you know, when the easement was granted and those rights were granted, there was no such thing as wireless. And we have this brand new business, not so brand new because, well, I mean, it's brand new when it's 5G because all of a sudden we need them uh, on every 10th house down here. Uh, Are you sure of that? I think that uh, you're probably exaggerating heavily. So uh, Scott, can you answer that question? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't believe these are 5G antennas. Um, as we had talked about at the last meeting, the, the, reason why we do this, where the reason why we do the small cells is because um, you have existing bigger facilities, towers that are providing some coverage, but then there are concentrated areas with a lot of traffic where you have kind of two options. One option is you could try to put 
you know, an 80 foot tower in this area to try to offload some of that kind of stress on the system. But obviously an 80 foot tower is, would be a nightmare and it's nothing that anybody wants to do in this area of town. So instead we install small cells that um, will improve the coverage in these kind of densely concentrated areas, but do it with a much smaller antenna that you know, tends to kind of blend in with all the other wires and guy wires and equipment and transformers that are sitting on the pole. So um, there isn't a plan to do hundreds of these. Um, as I think we've indicated, we've got six um, that uh, we're trying to finish out in Kenny Bunkport that will improve situation here. But these are not things that get installed um, in, in large numbers, because if you have a situation like that, that's when we come in with a new tower. Um, it, it, and um, and going to the, the kind of ownership issue on the poles, um, CMP is a regulated public utility. They have all kinds of ridiculous rights to run their poles and wires wherever they want. They have eminent domain authority. You know, they're the 800 pound gorilla and their job of course is to provide utility service to everybody and make sure it works. Um, the, the federal government um, enacted a law back in 2007 called the Spectrum Act that realized that these small cells were gonna become uh, you know, a new tool and a helpful tool in improving wireless service. So there's all kinds of provisions in the Spectrum Act about the utilities making sure that they're providing, they're offering their poles up for this service because it's a great way to improve service without having to build new towers. So um, you know, Bob's pet store cannot come on and put signs on CMP's polls because they would like to advertise. And that's because all of these entities are regulated as utilities on some level or another under state and federal law. And that's why we have this kind of relationship, but it's, it's a far more limited group of people that can use poles and wires. And it's really limited to people that are providing utility like service um, which the state and the feds have concluded that cell phone companies are kind of like providing utility service. And that's why um, we have this arrangement to go on the poll. So that's the kind of big picture. Okay, do we have any more questions? Okay, are there anybody, is anybody up? I'm oh, sorry? No hands up, you said? Okay. Well, uh, so I guess we'll close the uh, public hearing. And so Larry, how do you want to handle this? There's a lot of stuff, extra stuff you need for your... Uh, yeah, I really do. I mean, I, I've, I'll start, oh. I'll start the, the, you know, I'll start, I'll rough it in, but I still need, you know, Scott to provide that additional information before I can finish it. So, okay. I'll, I'll, uh, as soon as I get it, I'll finish it up. Okay. And then Larry, Larry would you agree though, that the, the nature of the material you need, you know, you put a, put a time on that, but it, it's not such that it's going to be something that has to go back for a more public hearing. It's really. Uh, oh yeah. I think the crux of the issue is uh, well defined in the application. You know, what we're talking about is just some clarifications to make sure the application is um, up to date, you know, with the correct address. And in fact, it's in the shoreland zone. And, well, and then of course the clarification letter, the authorization letter to make sure that Verizon is author has authorized Scott to, speak on their behalf you know those are the key things and then there's a few other little details that's and Scott, you have them all right yeah so i've got uh, I, I think i have them all the only request that i will make and after i make this request you can tell me to go away and say no um <laughs> but one of those things that is in this spectrum act is a 60-day shot clock for municipal review of these small cell facilities um, and in that first meeting, remember you, it, you shut down at nine and we didn't come up. So we had a couple week delay. So I never want to ask a planning board to make a decision on an application if you're missing substantive information. But if it was possible to do a vote, if you were so inclined with conditions of approval to 
go through and provide the list of things that Larry had identified, that would keep your vote within the 60 day period, which will run on July 12th before your next meeting. There is a way to deal with this. We could do, the, the problem is that I don't, this, this 60 day thing is controlled by the New Jersey lawyers and I'm not allowed to let the 60 days go without doing a tolling agreement with the town to agree that you won't hold it against us if we don't sue you on the 61st day, which is all completely absurd. But um, <laughs> but um, if if you felt comfortable with the with the facility and the, the substantive performance standards and could do a vote with the conditions of approval as Larry has set forth, um, and you felt comfortable with that, and it didn't make you angry at me or angry at Verizon or anything like that, that would just be something to tee up for you to think about. But again, if the answer is no, the answer is no. Uh, we, we would, if we, we vote on it tonight, we would still read the finding of facts after your date. Yeah, but that would be okay, because you would have taken, you would have made a decision subject to conditions that would stop the clock. Larry's wow. like, you got to be kidding me. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what to do, Tom uh, or Gordon. <laughs> what's the, what's the oh, best plan? So, so some of the things that I've, you know, that I've heard here, you know, are, you know, I think are minor in nature, you know, checking the box on an application, yeah. you know, that's a shoreland zone. Uh, you know, clearly Scott is here with the authorization of, of the folks who sent him. So I, I see that as a, you know, as a, you know, as a correct thing to, to ask for, for clarification. But uh, again, I see that as a, you know, that's a, that's a, a checkbox, you know, item, you know, the yeah. can, uh, the can height questions, um, you know, that I saw, but again, was, I think that's solved. I but, think we resolved that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There's just a discrepancy between, you know, uh, you know, an item that was in any application. So, I mean, again, it certainly is up to the board. You know, I see most yeah. of these items as clerical, you know, and clarifying in nature versus substantive, but that's, yeah, that's up the to the board. Are, yeah. I, I agree. I think the substance of the application is solid. It's just you know, making sure yeah, we can. I, I'm, I'm thinking we ought to approve it and make yeah. sure that you provide everything to Larry as soon as physically possible so that he can have a, a finding of facts ready for the next yep. meeting. Yeah. We will jump on it. Okay. So, so moved. So I move to approve the application and the, well, move at, to approve the application. I guess we have to approve the finding of facts, don't we? We approve that next time okay so we're going to approve the text gets approved when we read it well okay so we're going to approve the application we're going to approve the application yes and, okay uh, you know we're so i move to approve the application subject to subject, subject to, all to those conditions subject to clarifications that, yeah. as that we yeah. discussed yeah okay second that okay well, let's go through and we'll do this I'm in favor. Uh, Nina? You're in favor. Ed? In favor. Larry? In favor. John? In favor. Okay, so we are, we're, we have approved this application. Thank yeah. you. We, we so will read, these, the, read the finding of facts next time, and you'll yep. have to take and uh, file it at uh, the Registry of Deeds and all those okay. good things. All right, thank you very much. And thanks, Larry, for going through that with a fine tooth uh, uh, comb. And I'll get on all of those things and get them into Werner immediately. All right, thank you, Scott. Perfect. Appreciate that. All, all right. right, thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. That brings us to item 210504 John and Jennifer Schaefer, Peterson Design Group authorized agent. And this is a site plan review public hearing. So, do we have Mr. Peterson or somebody from his shop? And there he is. Have anything, anyone else you need in? 
Anyone else you need to be talking? Mm -hmm. I could bring them up. Put you on the spot, John. Okay, well, why don't you uh, give us a summary of your uh, of your your plan? Then we'll go through the uh, board members and so let's you could uh, if you want to just uh, promote your screen so we can all look at it again. You bet. Here we go. Mm -hmm. I'm working on it. Hang on one second, please. Okay. I just got my computer back this morning. They had to install a new operating system, so it's all new to me. Uh, let's see. Can you see that now? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. I'm sorry. Apologize for the delay. It should be working. Oh, goodness. Should be working. Werner, can you bring his stuff up perhaps? Okay, let's see. Yeah, yeah, I can uh, I can work on pulling that up. All right. Sorry about that. Thanks, Warner. I appreciate yeah. that. I apologize. So just wanted to uh, say Thank you to Chairman Boak and the board and Werner for hearing the application. Um, it's a pretty straightforward application. If only we could access the information. Yeah, this it says that uh, I have uh, I have PDF uh, access open. So, all right. All right. So, thank you, Werner. Sure thing. Yeah, bear with me. I'll try not to make everybody seasick here so you scroll down through and i'll pull my uh, application up at the same time assuming you want to go straight just to the site plan here i think so that makes the most sense oh, yep.
what I'm going to do too is drop a, I'm going to drop something in photos and open it that way, hopefully. We're already seeing your site plan from Werner, so right. you can proceed. Okay, so there's the existing survey. Thank you, Werner. That shows the footprint of the existing house with um, the existing driveway and the uh, front deck, back deck, enclosed shower area, and overhangs. And so what we're proposing is to, if you can move to the next one, Warner, thank you. Yep, there you go. So we are proposing to um, replace this structure in a way that's the most uh, conforming possible in that it uh, responds to all the setback lines which the last house did not, the, the previous house did not. It shrinks the footprint of the structure substantially so that the, the proposed house is quite a bit smaller in footprint than the existing house is. And it moves it closer to the street so that the, the structure portion of the house, the steps coming off the front porch, bump right against the, the uh, front setback line. So you can see that the, uh, the, basically the whole building envelope sits within the 75 foot setback. There's just a very small portion that's outside the 75 foot setback on the street side of the property. And so we are proposing that this new building uh, will take its 30% expansion, mostly by, by taking uh, the reduced footprint and adding that, adding the square footage that we take from from ground coverage footprint, putting it on the second floor along with the 30% expansion square footage and volume. So it gets smaller but taller. And um, we also are proposing to put it on a foundation that has flood vents and uh, that the first floor will be elevated to meet the proposed flood elevation. So we'll be 2.75 feet above the proposed uh, 13 foot FEMA uh, flood elevation. Um, we also, uh, like I said, our, uh, it falls under the 30 foot height restriction. Um, it, uh, it is connected to town sewer and water, which it will, it will remain that way. Um, let's see what I can tell. What else can I tell you about it? It, uh, it, uh, has, oh, one of the things that I uh, was mentioned at the last uh, initial review was uh, the uh, idea of putting an overhang over the back door. Werner, if you could move your cursor just to the right, just the shade. Uh, and there's a back, there's a back step, a back landing and steps that come off the back of the living room. Um, do you see that where that is, Werner? Right there. On the back, on the other side of the back side of the house, there's a oh back or right over here. Exactly. Yep. Yep. It was suggested that we put some sort of a roof overhang over that door, in the same footprint as the back porch, so that it would cast a shadow on that back sliding door and uh, satisfy the uh, uh, problem of potential bird strikes. So we'd like to do that, which doesn't increase the footprint at all. It just uh, response to the planning board members uh, request. Yeah, I think you can see that better on this elevation here, this. There you go. Yep. So those, those uh, that sliding glass door would have half of it covered in a screen as it is. And then with the addition of an overhang, uh, sort of a hood over that door, over where there's already proposed to be lock coverage, we would satisfy the bird strike. Um, request and not uh, not really change much as far as uh, lot coverage and all that. And to continue with that, the thought about that request that was made at the last meeting uh, by Ms. Perlmutter, the, uh, the two panels to the right of that are both screen panels in the in that back screen porch and on either side of the, of the chimney. And then above that, we can make those windows in swing casements that then have screens facing the outside. And then the window to the right uh, can also have a screen on it. So I think that will satisfy the, 
the bird strike question. Um, we also agreed that we uh, would not use fertilizers or pesticides unless they were organic on that parcel because of its proximity to the wetland. Um, I think those are the only questions that came up last time uh, as far as additional information. The one thing that, um, that I uh, put out there as a question to the board was we have about 520 square feet of lot coverage that's not being used as compared to what was there currently. And what we would propose is that on the back side of the house around the screen porch, you can see the dotted line of where the existing um, uh, house footprint was. Yep, right there. Yep. That that area could be a ground level stone patio just on the ground in the same footprint as what was there. And then uh, we could add a front walkway from the front door just to the driveway which would uh, use up a few hundred square feet. It still leaves about 156 square feet of lot coverage on the table. Okay. So, uh, any, uh, I to start with Nina, who's your, your uh, case manager. Any questions? Yeah, I do. Um, uh, I'm glad to hear about the back and you're going to cover things and put up the overhangs too. But I wanted to point out that whether you're using inorganic or organic fertilizers, nitrogen and phosphorus will cause blooms and cause problems in wetlands. And you're very, very close to those wetlands. So I would be very, very reserved about using any fertilizers at all, any pesticides. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's organic, whether it's slow release or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. The rain will still take the runoff into the wetlands. Um, I was going to ask about a walkway. Your driveway is now on the left. You're taking out the one on the right of this diagram. Am I correct? That's correct. Okay. So I, I was wondering whether you were going to put in a walkway there, and I assume it's going to be behind the 20-foot setback. Uh, the walkway would be in front of the 20 foot setback. Oh, it would. Okay. Yeah. Will it be, will it be impervious or pervious type materials? I guess I had envisioned there would probably be a, some sort of a stone walkway. That was my hope that we could do a, maybe a three foot wide by it's about 21 feet long, three or four feet wide by 21 foot long stone walkway, just to get us from the steps to the driveway. You know, it wouldn't go to the street. It would it would go to the left toward the driveway. I have a PDF. I have a PDF that shows what I'm proposing, but I can't. That's my my issue right now is I can't get that up to show you. Um, mm -hmm. Or if I email this to you quickly, can you use this? Uh, sure. Yeah, you can give that a shot if you want to email it. Um, I just did a stop share. I don't know if that helps you out any or not, but. Thank you. Let me send this right over to you. Okay, Werner. Um, do all stone patios and walkways count as impervious? Well, the you know it, it's not a question of pervious versus impervious. It's a question of vegetated versus non-vegetated. Uh, so the walkway, you know, uh, with you know with what Eric is describing, you know, would be considered a non-vegetated surface, and that would count towards your overall lot coverage since the property is within the shoreland zone. Um, uh, so, uh, so, you know, his, his request is appropriate, uh, relative to, you know, asking for that within, you know, the overall discussion of, of, you know, what the, you know, what the current lot coverage is, uh, you know, typically, so, typically whenever we deal with, you know, these types of questions, just, you know, you know, for instance, just a walkway and if it's over on lot coverage, then we ask property owners to do a swap you know, somewhere on the property removal in kind, uh, you know, like this. Now the, uh, the patio question, you know, the patio also, you know, it's considered a structure. Um, it's, it's so defined in the land use ordinance as a structure. Uh, and, and also, 
you know, would count towards, you know, a, uh, you know, a, the structure calculation for, for lot coverage, regardless of the surface type, you know. Okay. So in terms of lot coverage, we'll need some new calculations. No, actually we asked when we submitted our application, we asked for 35.59 coverage, which is what it was there currently. So I'm just filling in the blank on how we would like to spend that, uh, asking for the board's uh, guidance on the best way to spend that. I think we can't use it all, but if, if we can use some of it up, up to the, we've asked for 35.59, which is what was there currently. So if we chip away at what's remaining, which is some the delta between what we showed and what we asked for is about 520 square feet. And that's what I'm saying is that we'd like to use uh, something like 255 square feet of it as the back patio that falls within the footprint of the house that was there. And there you go. Thanks, Warner. So this is, uh, Nina, this is what I'm talking about. See in the back where the, the perimeter of the existing house is shown now as kind of a, an oddly shaped, but hopefully useful patio. Right. Uh-huh. And then there's the walkway in the front that we'd like to have a walkway to the driveway. Okay. So, so you'll be in the setback there. But almost any walkway that gets you from the front door right. to somewhere else than the setback. It's correct. Yes. You know, walkway, you know, walkways, sidewalks, you know, are not subject to a property line setback. Again, they're subject because they're in a shoreland zone, they're subject to, you know, being counted as a non-vegetated surface. Uh, but, you know, they don't count as a, uh, as a structure relative to setback. What about the back with the patio? So the patio basically is going He's going into an area that's already covered. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. He, he's pro the proposal is for a patio. Looks like it follows along the lines of the existing footprint. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, that's less vegetation to put down nitrogen and phosphorus on. Right. So. Okay. <laughs> It, but you already covered this in the cal lot calculations. I don't remember. Yes, on the, on the. I'll have to go. I'll have to go back and look. Okay. It's on the first sheet of the application form on the on the cover sheet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd right. like to see see that submitted to the office so that it can be included with the application. You bet. Okay. I don't have any. All righty. Uh, how about uh, um, Ed, do you have anything? Yeah, just to follow on to that, that same topic. Um, Eric, you, you made a point of saying that the footprint was going to be reduced and and that was a good thing. Um, and, and yet you're still maintaining the same lot coverage. And I'm I'm just I guess I'm I'm looking for something that shows me on the plan how you've spent that 35%. I, I wouldn't want us to be increasing the lot coverage in the area that's within the 75 foot um, proximity to the wetlands, for example. And I can't see that right now. I like the idea of being able to say, this is less non-conforming. Mm -hmm. It's not clear to me that I can do that right now. And if you could help me with that, I'd appreciate it. You bet. So the way it's less non-conforming is that it takes the, the bulk of the house and moves it out of the most non-conforming area up. If you can see the, see on, on the survey that Werner has pulled up right now, there's there's space outside the 75 foot line between the front of the house and the front setback line. You can, you see that? that no, I'm, I'm not, if, if I had a cur, if you had a cursor, you could, oh. Right there, thank you, yes. Okay. So 
there, that where where Werner's cursor is right now is a portion of the lot that is outside the 75 foot setback line, but not built upon, and is conforming to setbacks. So yeah. what we're what we're proposing is that our smaller footprint house pulls forward and puts itself up in that space as much as possible and removes itself from behind the 75 foot line. Well, almost almost all of that building on Bell Lope is behind the 75 foot line because that is that red that red line right there. But, yep. but if you're going to now cover that area with other artificial structures, it seems to me that that's not but, beneficial. But not all of it because we've still left 156 square feet on the table, which is okay. would be out in that back area that, that we did not use. So, so that sounds good. It's but I think we should be clear that it's less non-conforming because of that. That is correct. It was 35% covered before. It's yeah, 35 square foot less than that now, whatever that percentage turns out to be. And that's all from the worst area where it could be. You've, you've, you've eliminated that. And you've done that by uh, making some judicious uh, changes to, to the location of the, uh, of the house. And, and then kept the uh, the area to be kept the lawn area minimal by having a stone patio etc et and, and, and e e still reducing the uh, the coverage slightly mm -hmm. so we can submit a modified proposed lot coverage and number that the percentage will go down somewhat reflecting the 156 square foot less so i think that that's good i just like to be able to look on the site plan and say Oh yes, here's here's how the overhangs count. Here's how the patio counts. Here's how the you know that that yeah. level of. Uh, so if I use the if I if 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 you folks tell me that it's amenable to you to do the walkway in the front and the patio within the footprint of the house in the back, I can modify the site plan for the for the town records purposes to identify all those things in a very sort of. Uh, cafeteria style way does that make sense speaking only for myself i i think it sounds like a grand idea okay both of yep. those things and anybody else sounds good yeah that's the way it should be yes i like it eric i like it better than we're going to have a lawn back here yeah it's better <laughs> okay okay uh larry do you have anything well the only thing i noticed was there's a chimney um and um I, I so is this going to be for like for a wood fire uh, uh, fireplace? Um, it's actually a gas fireplace back there, so the chimney is more for effect. It's a okay. it's not a, yeah the the the, the uh, gas fireplace will direct vent right out the back. Okay. It couldn't be that close to the house and be a wood burning chimney. Well, that's why that's why I mentioned it because it seemed close. To yeah. Me, too close it's, to the house. Okay. It's for, so it's, it's for effect. It's going to be guaranteed they can't burn any wood in it. There's no flu, so no. Okay, got no flu. Okay, thank you. That's it. Okay. Uh, yeah. I don't know, John, you have anything? No, I don't. Okay. Well, I think that, uh, that we want to then open up the public hearing. Any hands raised? Okay, so uh, how are we going to handle this? You're going to submit some mods, and then we're we're going to vote to approve this thing next time. Is that the well? Way is, we there, go? is there a possibility of, of approving it tonight, and then I can, as backup materials, submit the uh, the the sort of reformatted reformatted numbers that respond to what you approve tonight for record. Well, we still have to do a findings of fact, and we won't do that until next week. Yeah, I mean, um, I, can, I can literally make these changes and get them into Warner tomorrow or Friday. So, so and then well, Nina's still going to have to update her finding of facts for the next time. Correct. So, we can just approve the thing next time and read this finding immediately. That's probably the cleanest. Yeah, you wouldn't, I don't think you could get a permit until the findings of fact are recorded. Is that right, Werner? 
Yeah, that's that's correct. Yep. Yep. No, I think I mean what Tom has just suggested. I think is you know is you, you can do it that way. You know, you can continue. You can continue the hearing. Yeah, you know, continue the public hearing right. to next time. Right. And then close it almost immediately with well. well that's right. Know. Yep. You you have to keep you have to keep the hearing open really to collect information to collect additional information, but right. uh, and then and then just do your findings, you know, at the same meeting. Sounds good. So I guess uh, I'll uh, move to continue the public hearing to next time, which is the twenty first. Second. Okay. And you, you can clarify for what purpose, you know, for the purpose of, you know, you know, accepting those, you know, the additional, you know, the additional information. Right. Yes. To, the site, to the site drawings. Yeah. So we will expect the, the updates and then next time we will approve the application and uh, read the findings of fact. So, sounds good. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, I guess I, I need a vote on uh, continuing the <laughs> continuing the, the public hearing or to next time. So, so you need a motion second? to continue or just a second? A second at this point. I'll I second. Okay. okay. So I'm in favor. Nina. In favor. Ed. In favor. Larry. In favor. John. In favor. Okay. Good. So. We'll see you next time. Uh, ideally, it won't take long, but you, you know, as long as you get everything to to Werner and Lisa, so they can get it to Nina, we'll get the uh, FOF squared away. We'll be all done. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Which brings us to item number four: two one zero five zero two Dow House Limited Partnership, Bradney Lown Authorized Agent. So is Mr. Lown there? Bradley Lown, L-O-W-N. Thank you. I guess we don't need Mr. Schaefer there anymore. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, can people hear me? Yes. Would you uh, like me to? Just hang on for a second. Uh, could we remove Mr. Schaefer from the, the screen? Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there. That's better. Okay, and Ed seems to have disappeared briefly, so. Uh, anyway, so, so Mr. Lon, we got uh, a bunch of uh, submissions in the last day or two, which is obviously not, not whatever our our required number of days in advance, but uh, we're glad that we glad to see that. I think we're referring to the uh, just you know the stuff that uh, that Nate Dill, um, you know, that we just got the other day. Right. Uh, everything else I submitted on June twenty eighth. Yeah, I, I can confirm that, Tom. We did, you know, I looked back at the email and that was submitted to uh, to Lisa and I on the twenty eighth. Okay. Can I ask why I never saw it <laughs> until today? It, we, we realized that it didn't get passed on to the board until today whenever we went okay. back through and look whenever whenever you asked for that information so i apologize uh okay. for that oversight but we did receive okay. it on the 28th so any anyway we we uh we had we've just got i'm sorry brad but we did just receive it us on the board uh so I was review it, reviewing it, and uh, I, I guess, uh, 
My, my questions relate to the pilings themselves, which the pilings are the piece that is grandfathered because they're still there. Is that correct? I think that's what Werner Gilliam said at the last hearing. Yeah. Yeah, from a zoning perspective, and you know, as I understand, you know, from what you know, the the law court acknowledged is that the pilings, you know, the pilings were grandfathered from you know from a zoning perspective, you know, to be able to be there. Okay, and are they all in good enough shape that you can do what you intend to do, or are there going to be some replacements? I'd like to make some replacements. Yes. Could I just uh, address this for one minute, Mr. Chairman? Sure. Yes, please. Uh, so at the June 16th uh, hearing, <clears throat> uh, I took careful notes of all of the issues and questions the board had, and there were 16 different issues, which I uh, then promptly addressed in my letter of June 28th. Uh, and I also submitted the, <clears throat> the so-called doc checklist that addresses the 19 different categories set forth in the ordinance. I responded to each one of the 19 points. I submitted a letter uh, uh, signed by my wife, which one of the uh, board members wanted, just to confirm that she was aware of what her husband was doing. Uh, and I submitted the minutes of the selectmen's meeting, approving, unanimously approving the application that was requested by one of the board members. <clears throat> and then Mr. Simmons was asking about a topographical map uh, with the pier superimposed on it. Now, what, what I did was I called our engineer, who is Nathan Gill, I think you all know who he is, for ransom, and I asked him uh, if he could do that for me. And he said uh, two things. He said, one, he, he, the, all of the information is in the Lomer application done by Ransom that was <clears throat> submitted to FEMA, which I then forwarded to Werner. Uh, and number two, he submitted a, uh, a map and a, and a uh, schematic uh, with directly to, to Werner by email. Uh, Werner responded to me yesterday that, uh, that uh, he thought maybe uh, the board wanted something else, but I, I don't uh, I, I mean, I talked to our expert on this stuff and he says the information is all there. Uh, I would also, if I could share the screen for a second, um, let's see here. Um, I don't know if the, can you see, this is just the packet that I submitted here. And I've got, <clears throat> I've got a number of photographs that really do a pretty good job of showing what's going on here. I don't know if any of the board members had a chance to come look at this, but there, there is the, there is the pier right there uh, at high tide. And I've submitted photos of the pier at low tide. Uh, that's it at high tide, the one I dismantled. This is the, this is the, uh, this is the uh, landward side of the pier. So you can see that it's low to the ground <clears throat> at the beginning. Um, this is at a low tide here. You can see the Mud flats go way out, you know, several hundred yards. Uh, you can see it in that picture too. And in that picture, that picture shows the, the staircase that just, it's just got treads and no risers. The, the water for a few hours a day will, <clears throat> will come in around those, did come in around those steps. There's another uh, angle on the steps at low tide. You can see it's most of the time, this is in the mud, uh, but a few hours every day, the water comes up so that you can, so that you can jump off the end of the pier into, uh, into the water, which is maybe five or six or so feet deep at the end. 
Uh, let me rotate this here. There it is. That's that's my daughter about 16 years ago. Um, so so that, that that's it. I've tried my best to respond to all of the board's questions and concerns at the last meeting, uh, and I think I've I've done that. I mean, I don't. The, the main DEP application is still pending, so I haven't heard from them. They're doing their best to to look at it. I've been in touch with them, but they're still reviewing it. So without going over all 16 of these points, they're in my letter. I, I mean, I can do that if you want me to, but uh, this is a, you know, a small residential pier that I'm just uh, trying to repair and uh, put some pilings on. Right. Well. Oh. Anyhow, as I, as I said, we just, you know, it's our, our mistake, but we just got the bulk of the data. So uh, we will, what I think the, uh, you know, if, if all goes well, it would still have, be having a public hearing in a couple of weeks. So uh, You certainly have, have provided us much more data, and obviously, if once once it, if it finally gets approved by us, it still would have to be would be pending that DEP thing, which obviously not going to get a building permit without it. But Tom, are uh, you suggesting that that we we could say that all of the materials that were requested have been provided, and therefore this application is complete? That's last time we. We could, even though we haven't reviewed that in detail. Right. I, 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 that's, I think that's what I'm saying is we, we, no. the last time, you know, we, we did not have enough data to call it complete. But, it, but it's I been believe a while, we're, we're, get, we're certainly getting there. I think we're, we're a lot closer to complete at this point. And, and uh, that, you know, I, I guess I would like to talk to other people on the board. But uh, can, can you tell me, or can you, could your, your guy just say roughly where, where within your property the uh, dock is on this uh, nice topo that you just got it sent us? Uh, well, yes, this is, uh, this is in um, paragraph six, uh, sorry, paragraph, um, A paragraph three. No, sorry. Hang on a second. I'm looking at my letter to to the board that has the exact or the pretty close measurements of of uh, where it is. Yeah, here it is. A paragraph three. It's it's 55 feet from the property line uh, to the east and 130 feet from the property line to the west. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and if, if you want, I can make, I can show you the, and I did submit a, a new diagram showing, showing that. Okay. Well, I think, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I, I would say that the uh, application is complete needs, needs to be, uh, we, we need to further review what you've sent, which is on us. <laughs> and, uh, but I guess let, let's go through the board, see what, who else might have anything to say specifically about it. Uh, Nina, do you? Yeah, I, I've looked at it. I looked at the new filings and everything. I, I don't think it's in the velocity zone and, and the uh, property lines certainly give good distance from from the butters, um, I have a problem in that I don't understand since our land use ordinance doesn't address it. The L shape and the stairs at the end, I started going through the FEMA documents. I started going through the main documents. I started going through the 
natural resources and so forth and statutes and everything. And <laughs> I know they all address because everybody is putting floats at the end of a at the end of a pier. They do not address a staircase at the end of the pier. And that's what's bothering me. We have no standards for that. One of the things I worry about since, you know, we have things like floats that are required to be taken up in winter or parts of piers, but 